Hi everyone, uh, my name is Will Engel and I'm with the Center for Teaching, Learning, and Technology. And uh, I wanted to thank you guys for coming out for Open uh, UBC Week. We heard a couple of great presentations this morning, uh, one on open access publishing and one on uh, massive open online courses and open courses. And I think this session really bridges those two sort of different areas and that's of course the subject of this talk. This conversation is on open textbooks. Uh, so it was actually just a year ago, roughly, that the uh, BC government introduced an initiative to create 40 open textbooks for the, some of the highest impact courses in second, uh, secondary education in BC. And I'm very excited that we have Mary Burgess with us from BC campus to talk about the project. Uh, Mary Burgess is the Director of Curriculum Services and Applied Research at BC campus. And she was originally scheduled to be here in, in person, but unfortunately with the fog this morning, uh, got fogged in uh, and wasn't able to fly over from Victoria. So we're bringing her in via uh, the internet, the power of the internet. So Mary is the Director of Curriculum Services and Applied Research at BC Campus, and she's speaking today on the BC uh, Campus Open Textbook Project, and will and we'll be giving us an update on the current status of the project, uh, individual faculty and institutional changes in practice, and the benefits and challenges of adopting open textbooks. Uh, so we are on a uh, live uh, webinar feed, so Mary's requested that, and I'll let her talk, but that basically, if you do have questions, to go ahead and ask them, and I'll be doing some moderating as she talks. So uh, raise your hand and get my, my attention if you have questions. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Mary. Thanks, Will, and thanks, everybody. And, and I want to thank you, Will, for being so flexible. The weather is now gorgeous here, but uh, until about 12 o'clock today, it was totally socked in with fog. So I wish I could have been with you all on campus there. Um, but unfortunately, sometimes I can't get off this rock. Um, so I just thought I'd put myself on video for a minute here so you can actually see what I look like. Um, and then I'll turn the video off so we can reserve all the bandwidth for the audio. And yeah, Will, if you want to just let me know if someone has a question, um, I'm happy to answer as we go along or at the end. Or if someone wants to email me afterwards, I'll provide my email address at the end. So, so with that, let's get started. And I'm going to turn my video off. Okay, uh, so let us begin. Uh, yeah, like Will said, uh, I'm the Director of Curriculum Services and Applied Research at BC Campus. Uh, what that really means is that I do the Open Textbook Project and all of our other um, o open initiatives at BC Campus, as well as the Educational Technology User Group and all, our other um, offerings in the area of professional learning. Um, for educators in the province of BC, so it's a it's a it's a very interesting role and one that I've been in for about a year. Um, I've been working in EdTech for about 15 years, uh, and the 10 prior to coming to BC campus, I was with the uh, Center for Teaching and Educational Technologies at Royal Roads. Um, so have been sort of fiddling in this area for quite a long time. If I had been there in person, I wanted to ask you guys uh, who was in the room with me. And so um, I'm wondering if you could maybe show each other by, by indicating um, what your role is in just a second when I ask you about it. The reason I like to, to get a sense of this is because when institutions think about a move to more openness, it's really important to consider all the roles of the institution, all the, all the people who would be touched by a move to uh, working more in the open, because it isn't just faculty and students, it's librarians and instructional designers and bookstore staff. So, um, so I'm going to pretend I can see you, and just so that you can see each other and who's in the room, who in the room is faculty or an instructor? Raise your hand. And now, who is a librarian person? And now, who is an instructional designer and tech person? And who is a bookstore person? So I hope you now have a sense from each other about, about the different people who have an interest in this project. and. Um, and you can sort of think about about how that might impact each other. And as I say, it's important to consider all the roles um, that would be touched by a move to more openness. 
I wanted to give you a, a, just a brief picture of what BC Campus is because not everybody knows about us and what we do. Um, we're not an institution, um, but we provide service to all the public post-secondary institutions in British Columbia, of which there are 25. Um, we were started in 2002 and we're funded by the Ministry of Advanced Education, just like the institutions are. Uh, and, uh, and, and that funding is used to provide services in the area of open educational resources and educational technology for the most part. Uh, we also do transcript exchange um, and a site called My Courses BC where students can search for online courses as well. Um, so, so our mandate sort of lies within that area. Um, we have two offices, one over here in Victoria uh, and one in Vancouver, and uh, there's about 24 of us, give or take. Uh, and we're governed by a strategic council that's made up of representatives from the post-secondary um, institutions in BC, um, presidents and vice presidents, academic, et cetera, of the institutions. So just so you have a sense of us. And if you're interested in learning more about BC Campus, uh, our website is bccampus.ca, and I encourage you to explore there. So just to give you a sense of what I'm going to talk to you about, uh, I'm going to start with just a, a brief description of what is an OER, an Open Educational Resource, um, just so that we are all sort of on a level playing field with respect to what we're talking about today. Uh, as Will said, I'll give you uh, an update on the BC Open Textbook Project, kind of where we've been and where we're going next. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about finding open textbooks. Uh, as well as the benefits and challenges of them. And then, yeah, the, the piece around institutional and the individual readiness for change with respect to open educational resources. So let's move on to OER. What are OER? So I'm going to put up a slide here that gives a description. This description comes from the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, and they are one of several foundations in the U.S that are putting money towards uh, advocating, creation, sharing, et cetera, of open educational resources to the tune of millions and millions and millions of dollars every year. Uh, there is a lot of movement uh, in the U.S. in this area and in other parts of the world, but, but the vast majority of what's being done in OER are, are being done south of the border uh, with some of that trickling up here um, as, as we move along. Um, in the U.S., there's policy being developed around the use of open educational resources, and we're not quite there yet in Canada, but projects like the one that we're working on at BC Campus sort of move us in that direction. Uh, the nice thing about the fact that there's a whole bunch of money being spent in the U.S. around open educational resources is that, as you can see here around the intellectual property licensing, what gets created in the state is also available for us to use and repurpose. Um, in some cases, that does mean that it's uh, American slanted content, but because of the way the license works, we can change it um, so that it is no longer American slanted content and we can make modifications to it. Um, so, so while I would love to have more money spent up here, I'm happy it's being spent somewhere that we can actually use it. So let's talk about the open in open educational resource and, and what that actually means. So Dr. David Wiley, who is, um, he's on sabbatical right now, but he's from Brigham Young University. He's so widely considered the father of the open educational resource movement. And he's put together this really helpful matrix to help us understand um, his view on openness. And it, it's the view that BC Campus shares as well around what open enables. So the first thing in the top left corner there is around reuse. And that just means that when you license something in an openly, that means that anybody who wants to can reuse it in whatever way they want to. So let's take the example of, say, uh, a quiz that somebody, another faculty has created. Um, you can take that quiz and use it with your students um, however you want to, to use it. Uh, revise, the top right corner, that means that you can make changes to that quiz if you want to do so, um, so that you can um, make it more appropriate for your students to use. Uh, tailor it more, more um, tightly to learning outcomes of your course or the interest of your students or your teaching context. On the bottom left, we have Remix. 
And what Remix refers to is really taking that quiz and some other open educational resources, um, maybe a piece of content, um, maybe um, some other um, kind of um, materials that you want your students to use, and you can pull all of those resources together into a new resource because of the way the licensing works. And then finally, on the bottom right corner, we have redistribute, and that just means that you can share what you've, what you've made, um, what you've changed, um, or the original document with whoever you want to. Now, all of this is predicated mostly on the use of Creative Commons licenses, and Creative Commons licensing can be quite granular, <laughs> um, and I don't want to go down a rabbit hole with you guys, but suffice it to say that Creative Commons licenses are what is most often used when licensing works openly. It doesn't mean that you lose your intellectual property rights. It doesn't mean that you're not the copyright holder. You still own that material. You just license it in a different way than is, is done traditionally so that it can get more adoption and use and reuse. Um, so if you're really interested in Creative Commons licenses, I would um, strongly advise you to go and look at the Creative Commons website, creativecommons.org, um, and, and they have a great section there about the licenses and what each of the licenses enables you to do. Uh, and if you have questions, I'm more than happy to help you with that as well. And I, I think there are probably people at UBC who know a lot about them as well who could help you, but that sort of gives you the basics. Um, around openness with respect to open educational resources. So let's now move sort of from the broader topic of open educational resources and, and talk about a more specific instance of open textbooks. So there are lots of different types of open educational resources, everything from entire courses to multimedia objects to assessment tools, um, and, and one of the types is uh, open textbooks. So where did this come from, the, the notion of open textbooks? So we have a couple of problems, right? Uh, one is that textbooks are extremely expensive, and they create a barrier to higher education for a lot of people. Uh, in many cases, students just can't afford the cost of textbooks, so they can't get the education they want or need. In addition to that affordability uh, problem, in traditionally published materials, the content is typically locked by the license, and that means that faculty really don't have control over their instructional resources. If what they want to teach their students doesn't align with the content of the textbook, they have to find other ways of delivering that content and do fudgy things like having students buy an entire textbook and telling them to only read chapters four, five, and six. Um, so, it just creates a barrier to the use of those resources and to creating really rich learning environments. So here are some quotes of what students think of textbooks. <laughs> and as you read through these, I'm sure they'll be quite familiar to you if you've worked with students at all. These are the kinds of things that they talk about when it comes to, to textbooks. And we've heard stories as we've done this project and, and talked with students and others of Students who are enrolled in a course, they find out what the textbook costs and they drop out. Uh, we've heard about students who can't afford to buy the textbooks for their courses until their student loan funding comes in. So for the first few weeks of the course, they're without the necessary resources. And as you can see from that fourth example down, um, students are also actively breaking copyright law and putting themselves at risk and their institutions at risk of, of legal action. So it's just not a great situation to be in. So we have some solutions to these, to these problems, and open textbooks are not the only solution. Um, they're just one alternative to the challenge, particularly to the affordability challenge. Uh, rentals and secondhand textbooks can also be used. Uh, we happen to be working on a solution that is free open textbooks um, at BC campus, but as I say, there are, there are plenty of other alternatives and other, other groups who are trying to, um, to work on that affordability gap. So let's talk about what is an open textbook exactly. I was going to do a what do you think. I don't know if anybody wants to try and take a shot at it and have Will throw it up in the, into the uh, um, collaborate window or, or tell me, but I'm curious to know if anybody wants to take a shot at it. What do you think is an open textbook?
Okay. Um, hi, Mary. My name is Devin Soper, and I'll take a shot. Um, so an open textbook to me, I suppose, would be um, a textbook that's, um, that meets all of the criteria that you just described in that matrix, um, or at least that would be an ideal open textbook if, if, if you could, you know, access it and uh, reuse it and remix it and uh, redistribute it as, as you uh, see fit. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. You're right. Uh, so, yeah, as you say, it, you can do what you want to do with it. You can make it into something that you need it to be for your students. So I'm just going to turn on my video for a second here to show you. Second. When it lets me go to the next slide. Come on. There we go. So I'm hoping you guys can see this. This is an open textbook. There's my window. So this is one of the textbooks that we have on our website. An open textbook is a textbook, just like any other textbook. You can just do more stuff with it, and it doesn't cost students any money. Um, so it's an instructional resource, just like other textbooks. It is often um, published first, uh, usually, as an ebook um, in a variety of formats. It's a printed book, like the one I just showed you. Um, and it typically uses an open license, usually a Creative Commons license, to enable other people to further share and modify that work. So it's really one of the reasons I'm excited to work on an open textbook project is because a textbook is familiar to everybody. Everybody understands that paradigm. Um, and so it makes it easier to sort of explain what we're working on in that case. So. Now I'm going to talk to you uh, a bit about the Open Textbook Project, just so you have a sense of what we're working on and, and hopefully can maybe envision how you might uh, become involved in the project in some way. So as Will said, yeah, it's been about a year. Um, October of 2012 at the Open Education Conference in Vancouver, um, then Minister of Advanced Ed John Yap announced funding for um, 40 open textbooks in the most highly enrolled first and second year subjects um, in British Columbia. And BC Campus is tasked with carrying out that project. So the funding that is associated with the project is a million dollars. Um, and so uh, and I just need to switch my slide here to the next slide. Um, and so we did a bunch of research into looking at what are the most highly enrolled first and second year subjects in British Columbia uh, and came up with a list. If you want to see the list, it's on the BC campus website. It's the kinds of things you would anticipate, right? So I'll read the, the top five are English, math and stats, psychology, economics, and biology. So they're the kinds of subjects you would, you would think about if you were thinking about, um, about highly enrolled courses at your institution. I want to be clear that the textbooks are not just for online delivery. Sometimes people think because they get initially created as ebooks that that's the case, but that is not the case. They're for all kinds of courses. Um, and then finally, um, they will be ebooks in multiple formats um, that can be read on all kinds of different devices. Uh, iPads, Android tablets, laptops, etc. And we're also providing a print-on-demand service, uh, which is at cost for students. So if somebody wants to have a printed copy of one of the textbooks, they can get that. We also have an e-commerce transaction that will come from our site um, and enable students to purchase a copy and have it sent to them at their homes. And that applies to students across the province. Anybody is, is able to do that. Um, so, and in most cases, the books will be in the range of about $30. As I say, it's at cost for the bookstore that's producing them for us. In some cases, it might be more than that if it's a book that has a lot of graphics, um, for example, or a lot of pages. Um, we are giving students where we can the option of getting a black and white copy or a color copy. And again, there are some price differences between those two. But, but our research shows us that um, students like to have a printed copy at this point still. I happen to believe that that's partly because ebook technology hasn't progressed to the point where it's all that satisfying an experience, but I think that once that happens and there is some more evolution in that area, um, then 
students will be less likely to want to carry around three heavy books in their backpack all day long. I know when I'm carrying around the giant textbooks to show them um, for these projects, I wish that we didn't have printed textbooks anymore. So let me tell you a little bit more about how we're running the project. Um, so the first thing we did was we went out and we looked in the commons, as it were, for existing open textbooks that came out of other projects that had started before us. Um, as I said earlier, there's been a lot of work done in the U.S. Um, with respect to the creation of open educational resources, specifically open textbooks. So we went out looking for those, and we talked to faculty, we talked to people from other uh, jurisdictions about the textbooks they were creating, and we harvested what we could find and put them up on our website. And then we did a call for reviews. Um, we created a rubric that was based on um, assessment rubrics for textbooks that other projects had used. And we put out a call for BC faculty who taught in those subject areas to review the textbooks that we had on the website at that time uh, against that criteria. Uh, and we paid reviewers $250 to do that. Uh, as a result, we now have 38 reviews on our website associated with the textbooks that were reviewed. Um, at that time, when we did that initial call for reviews, we had 15 textbooks on the site. So we have those 38 reviews against the 15 textbooks. Um, and, and the review process is one that we'll continue to do throughout the project. We think that from the perspective of enabling faculty to get a sense without having to read the entire textbook of whether something is high enough quality or um, aligned with the, with the content of that subject area well enough that they would want to adopt it, that having other faculty tell them that um, is the way to go. Um, so we, we intend to continue with the review process. The next phase, um, after that phase one call for reviews, um, is a call for adaptations, which we just released a couple of weeks ago. What I'm talking about when I say adaptations is that remix and revise aspect, right? So we're looking for people who want to um, find an open textbook or use one of the ones that we have on our website already and make changes to it so that it is appropriate for their teaching context and for the teaching context of other faculty in British Columbia. So we've put out a call for proposals. Again, you can see that on our website. Um, we uh, are doing it in 28 of the 40 subject areas because we were able to cover off the first 12 of the subject areas in our initial culling of the commons for textbooks. Um, so there are subject areas of 28 different um, uh, availability for doing adaptation work. In the process of those adaptations, um, BC Campus will be providing support to uh, people who want to do that work, um, technical support, instructional design support, multimedia support, etc., editors, um, as well as the technologies in order to be able to do that work. Um, in addition to the funding, which is what the million dollars is for, right? So we'll be paying faculty to do that work. So if you go and have a look at the call for um, adaptations, you'll get a better sense sort of of what exactly we're looking for. In addition to sort of a general call, we also used um, some of the reviews that we got in in our first pass to do some very targeted adaptations. So for example, we had a psychology textbook on our website that a number of the reviewers felt was missing some fundamental content. So we've put out a call for a targeted adaptation of that particular textbook to have somebody do that work for us. And again, we'll fund them to do the work and we will uh, provide the, the support that I talked about earlier. So the call for proposals for adaptation, those um, proposals are due on November 15th. We also put out another call for reviews because in the space between when we did our call for reviews in the spring and now, we've been able to harvest a number more textbooks. As the word has spread about the project, we've had people telling us, I know about this textbook. Oh, I wrote a textbook that I would like to have on your website, etc." So we put those up, and those are now available to be reviewed as well. Again, we'll fund um, BC faculty who want to review those textbooks $250 to do that work. So again, if you go to the, the BC campus website, you'll find the information about the call for reviews and how to tell us that you want to do a review. 
Um, so the next phase after that, um, when we get to um, uh, the end of this year, we will look at what we have managed to adopt wholesale from the Commons that seems like it would work right out of the gate. We'll look at what we have being worked on in terms of adaptation, and that will allow us to identify any gaps in the 40 that we're supposed to be producing. Because we anticipate that in, there will be some subject areas where there aren't any existing open educational resources that could be adapted or adopted. And at that point, we'll do a call for creation from scratch. So we'll be looking for people who want to write a textbook in, that, in those subject areas. And again, same kinds of supports that I talked about for the adaptations. We'll provide technical support, instructional design, editors, project managers, all of those pieces, as well as the funding to have people create those textbooks from scratch. And again, at that point, we will probably anticipate us doing another call for reviews um, in January as well, because we will have been able to harvest even more textbooks. And I also um, am planning on having us do reviews of the um, textbooks that get adapted and created from scratch. So this review process is, is really an ongoing thing that I think is really important. So that we'll be continuing on doing, doing that piece. I'm just going to take a breath for a second because at this point I'm wondering if anybody has any questions about the project. I do have a few more things to tell you about, about it, but I, if you have questions, I'll, I'll take a breath for a second. Any questions? It doesn't look like there's any questions at this time, Mary. Okay, good. I'll carry on then. I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about the technologies that we're using for the project. Uh, we um, have a partnership now with a group called Pressbooks, which is an ebook creation tool that's um, a WordPress plugin. It's a company out of Montreal, and we're contributing code to their project to make uh, an ebook creation tool that works well for textbooks. Um, and, and enables things like embedding multimedia, importing a variety of file types, creating indexes and chapters, and all the pieces that are important for textbooks. Uh, we also are using uh, a repository. Some of you may know about our solar repository at BC Campus, which is hosted on the Aquala system, which ironically is a Pearson product. Um, but we, uh, we, so that's where we're storing the textbooks. As I'll speak to a little bit later, however, some of you who have used solar may have found it difficult to find things in there, and that's fairly typical of a repository experience. So what we've done is we've built a WordPress site that just displays the textbooks and makes it easy to find the textbooks themselves by subject area. So if you go to uh, our opening education site, which is open.bccampus.ca, you'll find that WordPress site and you'll be able to go directly to the textbooks just so you're not trying to muddle through um, all of the other materials that are in, uh, on our solar site. Just so you can see, this is what a textbook looks like in Pressbooks, the software I was talking about. It looks like an ebook, right? So you've got your table of contents, you've got your content. Um, as I said, it, and you can import a variety of file types and modify them, or you can start from scratch. You can embed multimedia um, and, and link out. Um, there are definitely plans to do some more innovative things uh, with the technology as we move forward um, so that we can sort of not just be working with what we know a textbook to be now, but what, with what we could envision a textbook to be. Um, sort of a hybrid between a learning management system experience and, a, and an ebook creation and, you know, the ability for students to annotate things and talk to each other about the textbook in the context of the content that they're interacting with. And so uh, we wanted to make sure we were working with an open source tool, which Pressbooks is, so that we could make those kinds of modifications to create really rich learning environments. So I just wanted to give you a quick um, screenshot of a piece of the website. So if you go to open.bccampus.ca and you find a textbook that you're interested in, you'll see here just in um, a part of the, this is just part of one of the pages. 
So up at the top of the page, there would be the title of the textbook, but then there's a variety of um, file types that you can download, um, as well as down below here, you can see the reviews that have been written by the faculty who uh, were paid to review this particular textbook. Just so you have an idea of kind of what, what we're dealing with, as well as the Creative Commons license that's associated. We are in the process right now of um, implementing the print-on-demand service. So that will be an additional button here that says get a printed copy of this textbook, which will trigger the e-commerce transaction for students or anybody else who wants to um, get one of the copies of the textbook. So let's now talk just briefly about finding open textbooks. And I don't, uh, for anyone who's tried to find an open textbook or another open educational resource, it's really hard. I, it, as someone who works in the field, I struggle with it. I can't imagine what it's like for a faculty member with a full teaching load to think, I'd like to find an open resource, and then encounter the kinds of barriers there are when you try to find um, open resources on some of the repositories, because you end up with 300 results that you can't sort. And I mean, really, who has time to go through 300 records to find out if something is useful to them or not? Um, so it, it, it's a it's a real a real problematic piece for um, for people who are willing adopters. Um, so that's one of the reasons why we wanted to focus on findability for our resources. Um, some of the places you could look if you're looking for an open textbook, uh, our website open.bccampus.ca. Connections is another repository, <clears throat> and associated with the Connections project, which is out of Rice University, is OpenStax College, and they are making some very, very high quality open textbooks. Um, they're spending $500,000 to a million dollars per textbook, and we thank them very much for that because we're adopting all of their textbooks um, and making modifications to them so that the content is, is more Canadian. Um, Merlot is another one that some of you may have used in the past. And Merlot actually just did a major update to their website, and it's actually much more usable than it was in the past. Um, and they have reviews and things associated on their website as well, which makes it easier to find something that's useful. Um, and then OER Commons is another one there. So benefits and challenges of open textbooks. If I was in the room with you, I would be asking you the question, what do you think are the benefits and challenges of open textbooks? And maybe you want to have a conversation with each other after the session. Um, but, but really, in terms of benefits, the primary one, obviously, for students uh, is the ability to save them money. But not just that piece, right? I think what is becoming more and more important is the ability to tailor content to student needs, to your learning environment, to your teaching style, um, to the learning outcomes of your course. Um, and, and that's really important not just for faculty, but for students as well. Um, in terms of difficulties, um, sometimes they're very difficult to find. Um, and sometimes it's hard to assess the quality of a textbook. And again, that's why we wanted to associate reviews with our textbook, uh, so that we'd be able to uh, help people assess the quality and whether or not the resource was appropriate for them. So I wanted to talk to you also briefly about in individual and institutional readiness for change. And I talked at the very beginning about sort of considering a, a more holistic view of your institution when you think about adopting an open textbook or, or thinking about a move to more openness. So I've got some questions for you to think about here. And I'll just talk through them a little bit. <clears throat> so the top one there, what would need to be in place for you to adopt an open textbook? How can you make that happen for yourself, right? So thinking about what kind of support you need as an individual instructor to make a decision about an open textbook or a, or a change in textbooks generally. What sort of things do you need to have in place to make that a success or an easy process for you or something you could even conceive of doing? The second question there about the value of collaboration at your institution. We ask that question because we really need to think about instructors being willing to share resources with each other, to develop resources together. Uh, openness works so much better when people talk to each other and ensure that no one's reinventing the wheel. Um, it also helps quality if uh, instructors are willing to work with each other and ensure that the resource is going to be usable in a variety of contexts. 
The piece about the creation of new work being more highly valued um, uh, than the reuse or revision of existing work. As I'm sure you're all aware, in some institutions, research is more highly valued than teaching, and so the creation of primary research, it's, it's a noble cause, absolutely. But what that can create is sort of a cultural barrier to adopting or adapting work that someone else already started with. And so that's something to think about your institutional culture and, and how, how that works for, for you. Um, and, and, a, and, and, and a potential barrier uh, with respect to sort of pressure from colleagues to be doing things the way they do things. And, um, and, and that might be a barrier for some instructors in terms of their willingness to adopt or adapt. And then that final piece there around um, investing time in curriculum design and effective learning environments and, and those pieces, to think about adopting an open textbook or really any OER is to consider what's best for student learning. And in some cases, instructors really, they barely have time to breathe or get to their class or, or assess all the work that's coming in for their students, let alone taking time to consider redesigning their curriculum to better meet student needs. So there really needs to be institutional support for that activity. Um, the, the, the time that it takes to really think about how would I change my course so that it was better for students and how would I incorporate this new instructional resource that happens to be an open instructional resource. If you're not given the time to do that and that kind of work isn't valued at your institution, it makes it very, very difficult to, to feel okay about, about moving ahead in that way. These are all really just food for thought for you and, uh, and things to consider um, both as an individual and as, a, as a, an institution and have those conversations if that's something that you're interested in, in looking at. So we have had a chance to talk about a number of different things here today. Um, the concept of openness generally, um, licensing open textbooks, and I'm really hoping that this is giving you a clearer understanding of those concepts. Um, if you've got questions, I'm happy to answer them now. Um, you can also contact me separately, and on my next slide, I'll put my email address. Um, I'm more than happy to talk to anybody at any time about, about the project, about Creative Commons licensing, about the questions that I was asking about institutional and individual readiness for change. Um, so I will stop talking now and put up my email address, and if anyone has questions, please go ahead. Hi, Mary. Just to uh, get things maybe started, uh, what role have libraries played in this? We have a number of librarians in the room today. Um, and have you reached out to libraries at different institutions? Yeah. So coincidentally, I was at the uh, Council of Post-Secondary Library Directors meeting last week in Kelowna. Um, because we see the role of librarians as crucial to the success of OER adoption. People are accustomed to the library as a hub in the institution to go and find quality resources. Um, librarians know how to curate things. They know how to help people find things. And they're a trusted resource. So we see that as, as an incredibly important piece. So we started with that meeting last week to talk to the library directors not just about how they could envision supporting OER adoption in their institutions, but as a consortium, how could that group uh, work together to potentially do some things that would be shared across, uh, across the post-secondary system in British Columbia. Um, next week, I'm going to meet with librarians at UVic um, to talk to them specifically about their own context. Um, and I would be happy to do the same at UBC. Um, so, so yeah, absolutely. Libraries, we feel, are, are just absolutely crucial um, to, to OER adoption um, and, and getting faculty to understand that they exist. Uh, we're also working on things like looking at MARC records, um, LibGuides for open educational resources, those kinds of pieces. So it's something that we started working on um, in the last several months. And honestly, at the meeting last week in Kelowna, I was so impressed with some of the ideas that came up and the commitment to working um, to working with us and, and, and helping faculty find open resources.
Hi, Mary. This is one of the librarians here, Hilda Collenbrander. Um, thank you for a very interesting presentation. I, I was interested to know to what extent people or institutions are beginning to adopt the open textbooks that you make available. So I'm just going to repeat the question back just so I'm sure. You, you're asking about adoption and, and are people adopting? Is that the question? That's right, yes. Yeah. So this is a piece that we've been working on quite a bit. It's a real struggle for us, honestly. This is one of the hardest things I'm finding. So we do know specifically about some adoptions um, because we've been in contact with faculty or faculty have come to us and told us. For example, we have a shining example at Quantlin Polytechnic of a physics instructor who's using the open fact physics textbook. Um, he has saved, in his class of 40 students, this year alone, he has saved those students $11,000 in textbook costs because the cost of the textbook in that class course that he was using had gone up so much in the 10 years he'd been, he'd been teaching the course that he couldn't conceive of continuing to charge his students uh, in that way. Um, so, uh, so we have a few examples of that. Because our system system is quite disparate and siloed, and because within institutions there's a lot of silos, it's very, very difficult for us to find out about adoption. So we're using a variety of ways to do that. We've got an adoption tracker on our website where we ask people to tell us if they're adopting something. We're using analytics on our website to track downloads. And we're about to put out some um, feeds to ask people to tell us what they know about it. But that has been a real problem for us, and we really want to be able to report out on that because the more adoptions we get, the more likely it is that we'll get more funding to uh, create more resources. Uh, hi, Mary. It's uh, Brian uh, from TRU crashing the session here. I, I have one really mundane question that kind of you may have already just answered, but. Um, in terms of promoting adoption uh, within an institution, you know, um, we've definitely been doing, you know, the kind of workshop, information session, distributing resources electronically through networks and, the, you know, kind of that broad-based uh, kind of broadcasting approach towards promoting adoption. And it's I, where I'm getting to now, given that we have, still haven't had much actual adoption that I'm aware of, is thinking that maybe um, more direct approaches in terms of trying to identify instructors or department heads or things like that uh, might be more appropriate. And I'm just wondering if in your encounters with people in other initiatives, if, if you've kind of heard kind of on the ground stories of kind of how to get, you know, kind of one classroom at a time type adoption to maybe start having some of the success stories that you just referred to. Yeah, so we've done we've done a, a bit of everything, and and yeah, including talking to different groups. We did um, a lot of outreach in the spring with articulation committees, for example. So I think we went and talked to somewhere in the neighborhood of fifteen different articulation committees, because we think that that's one of the ways that that we might get more adoption. That, for example, an articulation committee might ultimately be willing to. Um, take on a textbook as a group and Hi Mary, we just lost you I think on this end. Are you still there? No. So it looks like we just lost Wi-Fi. Or not Wi-Fi. We're actually on a wired connection, um, but uh, we're at the the point of the session where we're we're rounding up, and I'll follow up with Mary uh, as soon as I can to to thank her for this engaging uh, session. I just also wanted to throw one piece out there that I think is a um, connects with the earlier session on MOOCs and, and open education or MOOCs in the library role uh, in open courses is where I've seen open textbooks adapted are at UBC's MOOCs and open courses because it eliminates the issues of being able to provide resources to students that exist beyond our licensing agreements here at UBC. So that is a, a driver. Uh, thanks to Mary again and, and uh, I will be in touch with her shortly.